That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about the worst and or our least favorite films <laughs> of 2023. Um, so this is not to be mean. Some of the films on the list we really thought were horrible. Uh, all of them. All so, of these films are horrible. Although some of them were fun to watch. Yes, and we meticulously went through and decided on this list together because I have a separate published list of worst films of 2023. That's right. I, um, I did kick some sacred horses uh, that people were upset about. but So important to know, all of the films on our list, there are 10 films. We have full-length video reviews on YouTube, so I'll put those links in the description. I would highly encourage people watch those because... For the people who do watch us, they seem to like those types of reviews the best, and I do too. Uh, but another thing to note is, um, as of this filming, and according to Letterbox, Nick, you have watched 1,046 films in 2023. Yes. And I have watched 356. <laughs> Which is still a lot. Yeah, it's a film a day, almost. Yeah. And the year's not over. But... Uh, I think, yeah, we have a nice pool to pull from. So let's get started. Number 10, The Mother. Directed by Nikki Caro. The premise for this film. While fleeing from dangerous assailants, an assassin comes out of hiding to protect the daughter she left earlier in life. Uh, We're obviously just going to give like little, like, quips from what we remember because there are full reviews but what i remember from this is just watching j-lo be because at a point she goes into hiding so she's like a wilderness woman yes hunting uh, living off the land with a full head of vigorous brown extensions and makeup and makeup mm -hmm. which just threw me off for the bears like why are we wearing all this makeup oh my god there was just so much about it that and gail garcia bernal is a like an eccentric queerdo. I don't know what yeah. he was doing in one scene with a bunch of candles lit. It was very Bad Boys 3 to me. Or Tony Braxton. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> and what's that song? I Heart You. Yeah. <laughs> we like Tony Braxton, though. Yeah, and we like that but song. But that's a fun song to make fun of. And the music video. And but, Joseph Fiennes is like the villain. And poor Omari Hardwick. As a federal agent who feels obligated. Who's indebted to J-Lo. Uh, this, you know what, this film should have felt like uh, Robin Wright's directorial debut, Land, where she recuses herself from humanity and lives in a cabin in the woods and almost freezes to death, but this is not that film. Number nine, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. This is the newest film on our list, mm -hmm. directed by... James Wan, who I, I like Insidious quite a bit, the first one. I'm going to read the IMDb premise and I, because I think this will be very telling as to how I feel about this movie. Having failed to defeat Aquaman the first time, Black Manta, still driven by the need to avenge his father's death, will stop at nothing to take Aquaman down once and for all. This time, Black Manta is more formidable than ever, wielding the power of the mythic Black Trident, which unleashes an ancient and malevolent force. To defeat him, Aquaman will turn to his imprisoned brother Orm, the former king of Atlantis, to forge an unlikely alliance. Together, they must set aside their differences in order to protect their kingdom and save Aquaman's family and the world from irreversible destruction. Uh, like, as tedious and bloated as that sounded... The film's worse. The film's worse. And not really doing all of that. And really not. And this premise I read is different from the premise we read in our actual review video, which also was off. Mm -hmm. I understand that this film was cut all kinds of ways and had to be reshot and even though this is the most recent film we've reviewed i really don't rem remember much from it my overall feeling is that this movie feels like when someone gives like their two-week notice and so it's like why even bother coming to work because they're not giving anything mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't yeah, care like about I'm a, anything i'm about to be clocked out and pick my, pick up my last check so i'm good yeah and that is this is everybody in this film suffers from well, uh, just really poor storytelling, a, a, a terrible script. Uh, Questionable CGI. I mean, what, what a waste of Nicole Kidman. Oh, for sure. Number eight, Carmen. 
The premise, Benjamin Millipede's complete reimagining of Carmen tells a story through an experimental dreamscape featuring an original score and songs. So Benjamin Millipede is Natalie Portman's husband? Yeah, the choreographer. He's a choreographer. And it might be pronounced more like Millipede, but... Oh, my apologies. <laughs> I think, but... Uh, so, oh my God. There was so much about this movie that brought me the wrong way. Well, including the lead, Melissa Barrera, who's beautiful but dead behind the eyes. Not captivating. And Paul Mescal. You know, there, there are so many versions of Bizet's opera, my favorite being Preminger's uh, Carmen Jones with Dorothy Dandridge. But this feels like an exploitation film because it's trying to uh, reconfigure Carmen's story as... Like an uh, immigrant an, story? An immigrant story, but she's also still a femme fatale. <laughs> I, I, I thought the choreography was awkward. The... Oh my gosh, just so much about it felt... My overwhelming feeling about this movie was why did this person want to tell this story? I don't know. And, and also, not everyone can just be a director in my mind. But I have to sh uh, drag the critic that's listed on the poster, who's, oh, somebody, here we go. who's somebody whose opinion I never agree with anyway from IndieWire. I don't, he's not even worth my saying his name. But oh. the poster quote is undeniably exhilarating. Sir, it is it is deniable. <laughs> this, this exhilaration is deniable with a capital D. This film is raggedy. Uh, I mean, of course, when I think of Carmen, I think of Dorothy Dandridge and to think like how captivating she is. I mean, even the lead in this film, the way she styled, just everything is like, what about this woman is making Paul Mescal's character risk it all? And it's unfortunate because the opening of this film uh, is really interesting because I think it looks really nice, but the opening is a flamenco dancer performing in the middle of the desert, which, which, which was beautiful. But then once we were, like, the writing, the storytelling. And poor uh, Rosie De Palma. And then Rosie De Palma, who is the best part of this film. She is a friend of Carmen's mother and owns this nightclub in L.A. somewhere that is, like... I mean, I guess calling it a dreamscape. I mean, it's more like a lukewarm nightmare. But, mm -hmm. yeah, it... This, this is Campbell's soup nightmare. That's... <laughs> Damn. Number seven, Hypnotic. Uh, directed by... Robert Rodriguez. The premise, a detective investigates a mystery involving his missing daughter and a secret government program. Oh. Poor Ben Affleck. He, you know, all the memes on Instagram of him looking miserable come to life in this movie. Oh, he's bored throughout. He yeah. looks like he's sedated and irritated. Like he just woke up from a nap. But not a refreshing nap. The nap where you wake up and you're not sure what year it is. That kind of nap. Mm -hmm. Oh, the story. The, this idea of these people who have this like... They're hypnotics. Th this sort of, sort of like superpower and right. how this program wants to control them. And Ben Affleck has a daughter that's a super hypnotic or whatever. I don't remember. It's been... I watched this in May. Well, I remember the gag of the film is that the first hour or so that we watch, we find out at a point that all of that was a simulation. He's, he believes at the beginning that he's looking for his daughter, but actually he erased his own memory so he couldn't find his daughter and the... So this program is putting him through a simulation to see if through his thoughts they can find the girl. Because she's like the ultimate hypnotic. Yeah. Oh, the name. And then of course all I could think about was the blue drink. <laughs> no Gouda. Number six, Dear David. The premise, a man is haunted by the ghost of a boy named David who is trying to kill him. Uh, based on a viral Twitter thread, thread from 2017, BuzzFeed, who was involved in making the film, directed by John McPhail. It's a fail. It's a fail. It's a big fail. And it's unfortunate because after watching the film, I read the, like, the Twitter thread and I, when we listened to stuff about it, and it was actually kind of interesting. There's an interesting way to spin this instead yes. of just p pasting, this is based on a true story and then give us ghost reenactments. Well, that was what killed the film is that, you know... I can't roll my eyes hard enough at that. And poor Augustus Prue. Who I think is really cute. He has great hair in this movie and he really is trying. But this story is told in such a stupid way. Like, to take a real thing and just inject like, oh, and then the backstory of the Little ghost boy is so dumb. The backstory of Augustus Prue's character who can't say I love you to his boyfriend. 
Because clearly this person, the, 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 the lead, works for BuzzFeed. So he, a big part of his job is to get engagement and be sort of a public figure. And I feel like the film could have approached this from this, like the, the intersection of the pressure to tell a story and maybe imagining something. It didn't even have to be supernatural. It could have been about this own, this person's own like psychosis or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, a and, fail. You, and you could play with ambiguity, but this is not ambiguous. We get full on scenes of a ghost boy on the internet in AOL chat. And then rooms. he's like, "I'm going to move upstairs in my apartment building." Oh, there's so much about it that doesn't make sense. Number five, Back on the Strip, directed by Chris Spencer. I think this is the second directorial debut on our list after uh, Carmen. Sorry. <laughs> the premise, a young man moves to Las Vegas to pursue his dream of being a magician, only to end up joining a male stripper group. Overwhelmingly, my thought about this film is there are so many talented people in it. Wesley Snipes, Tiffany Haddish. J.B. Smoove. Gary Owens, J.B. Smoove, uh, Faison Love. There are so many talented people in this movie that is not funny. Like, like, like I just don't... It's clear that maybe they all are friends with the director mm -hmm. and he pulled in a favor. But I always say, if you're going to do something, do it because you want to, not because you feel like you have to. I feel like everyone in this movie was yeah. doing it because they felt like they had to. You can't tell me all of these comedians read these lines and didn't think this shit is not funny, but they just said them anyway. And then... The lead character is the younger guy. Because uh, it's about an aging group of strippers, kind of like the Full Monty. Who come back together. Well, they're new strippers in that, but... Yeah. You know. they, they come back together just to sort of reclaim something. Well, it's also to help keep the casino open, who's, which is run by... Um, what's that actress's name? The white lady who runs the hotel? I don't remember. You know her because you complained about her in the review. But she is the 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 reason all these men are coming. All, oh, all of these successful, like all of these men have lives now. They don't need the money. They don't. They're Colleen just, Camp. That's it. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Mm -hmm. She's in the movie too much. This character makes no has no purpose really. Then the main kid who has a has a big black trident. Of his own. Yeah, the joke is that he has this enormous penis. Mm -hmm. And then when we finally see him in his undies, it looked very average. Like, it's not consistent. Sometimes it's it looks like there's something abnormally or unbelievably huge in there. And then sometimes he just looks like a regular guy. What a poorly made movie. Yep, uh, uh, in every conceivable way. Number four, On a Wing and a Prayer. Oh! Directed by... Sean McNamara, who's made it to several uh, faith-based films, including Soul Surfer. Dozens of movies. Mm -hmm. Yes, many films that he should stop, probably. But here we are. After their pilot dies unexpectedly mid-flight, Doug White has to safely land the plane and save his entire family from insurmountable danger. This oh. is based on a true story about a pharmacist uh, who this happened to, and this pharmacist is played in the movie by Dennis Quaid. And his wife by Heather Graham. Uh, I want to so see somebody edit this into Society of the Snow. <laughs> it's just... This was one of those ones that I didn't... Like, it was fun watching it because it's just so ridiculous. There, there's a scene where Dennis Quaid is questioning his faith, but he's not acting in a way that I believe no. he's doing that. It's it's so crunchy. And then it's so weird because Heather Graham... Built her career has her, changed a lot, yeah. Well, her early career was she was a nymphette in all these like very sexually provocative roles. And then even this year, she's in Suitable Flesh uh, as this... I think some kind of cannibalistic doctor. So it's like, but then you're in this faith-based film. Okay. I don't know. Of of all the films on our list, I would say this one could be fun. From my perspective. Watch it with people and yeah. drinks. Number three, Ruthless, directed uh, by... Art Camacho, one of the three December releases starring Dermot Mulroney. A high school coach whose teenage daughter was murdered takes matters into his own hands by going after the men who kidnap his student for their human trafficking operation. A lot to unpack in that statement. Mm -hmm. This is a recent review. Um, I think the... I thought the tone was so weird because it's about a very serious issue, right? Sex mm -hmm. trafficking. But then there's a comedic element to it. Mm -hmm. And I understand that the original script was different and 
and I was told that it was cut in a way that wasn't necessarily the intended story. Well, like but, a lot of these films. But unfortunately, yeah. the product we received is the products I watched, and yeah, it's just... Most films are a matter of compromises somewhere. I do think uh, this film could be fun as well to watch with people, because we were laughing while we were watching Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like a wrestling coach in high school going to Vegas, the policeman... The LAPD Ugh. policeman he's working with is telling uh, Las Vegas PD that he's working with them. It's it's crazy. The plot points are crazy. It's crazy, yeah. Number two, Till Death Do Us Part, directed by... Timothy Woodward Jr. After bailing on her wedding, a former bride-to-be must fight off her ex-groom and seven angry killer groomsmen in order to survive the night. Oh... The lead... Natalie Byrne. I thought she she seemed to put in a lot of work she did. in this movie. So shout out to her. But this story of these like seven groomsmen trying to like capture her, half the movie is them at her house. Just wandering around. Just the house, hanging out. The house is not big enough to support uh, no. this narrative. Uh, th this Tarantino ripoff. Uh, With Cam Jinganje as Orl like the notable person. Orlando and, and Orlando Jones. Jones. And they're just... It's just insane that these characters are walking around and then she is slowly, one by one, beating them up. Mm -hmm. And then we find out that it's her husband who's responsible for trying to, like, take her out. Because they're all part of this, like, spy, espionage network. I don't know. Just like the governor played by Marsha Mason in Nick of Time. <laughs> okay. Our pick for the worst film of 2023 is probably not a surprise. It's The Unseen. Directed by Vincent Shade, no Sade. A law student finds himself in a twisted web of murder and deceit brought on by a dark force from his past. This checks all the boxes, like bad cinematography, special effects. Storytelling. Story acting, writing, writing, acting. And it's unfortunate because I wanted to watch this because it featured R.J. Mitty, who yes, I like. From Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. But man. This was written by Jennifer A. Goodwin, who should be dragged considerably, because uh, she also has inserted herself in the film production playing RJ's sister, Ugh. and she should have been cut, Those that, that footage should have been cut and burned. It's bad. There's also a backstory to this film about a producer being accused of, like, harassment or something, so this was a troubled production, but I, after watching this, I was so perplexed, I tried to do research on the writer, the screenwriter, and she, it would be worth someone's time to watch an interview or two with her because it just seems like, yeah, not everybody should be trying to make movies, I guess, but <laughs> this, this story is really more interesting. Like, if I had to try to be positive about it, I think there's like a true crime element to it that's interesting. But then they try to insert like this supernatural component that feels so tacked on. I mean, a torturous experience would be to make somebody sit down and watch Dear David and The Unseen back to back and then make them say positive things. Well, that's all. Uh, yes, yeah, so all of these films we have reviews for, so the links are below. Please check them out. Um, it's undeniably exhilarating. Is that all? <laughs> yeah. Follow us on Patreon. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,